Father in heaven, we thank you once again for your word. We want to study it and learn today as we share together. Help us therefore to consider everything that you say as being very personal for each one of us. May we be able to leave our time together today with a better understanding and with an encouragement to do what you want us to do, recognizing that you always want the very best for us. We know that we'll be talking about some things that uh, are issues about which a lot of people have disagreements. So we especially pray that your Holy Spirit will direct our thinking in the right direction and give us a correct understanding in light of the context. I thank you for each one who is here. I pray that everyone will receive a blessing and that we'll all be aware of your presence with us. Thank you for speaking to us through your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians and verse 12. Verse 12 reads, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Right at the very beginning of our study now, some people could take that and run with it and say all things are lawful for me, would suggest, okay, if he means all things, there's nothing illegal, nothing wrong. I can do anything I want to do. Obviously, that would be a wrong understanding of the way in which he's using words. So we want to be very careful how we understand what he's talking about here in light of the whole uh, circumstance under which he's writing these words. What is included in all things that are lawful for me? I think what he's saying is, Everything that God has created has a purpose. If there's a reason why he created it, there's a tremendous balance in nature that many times we're not aware of. And then we become aware of it when we mess around with what God has intended should be a balance. Uh, aren't you glad that God has uh, arranged for some creatures to eat insects? Oh, yeah. I am. But that was not an accident. That was purposeful. Now we know that insects can be harmful to us, but uh, it's nice to know that uh, God has made arrangements for that. And a lot of times we just fail to understand things in light of why did God make them. And I'll be very honest with you, there are a lot of things that God made that I don't understand. But I certainly believe God's word. And we're dealing primarily here with each one of his individuals. Uh, so let me just illustrate this first answer. Uh, God created food for us. And it's right for us to eat food. But it's wrong for us to be a glutton. Now what is a glutton? A glutton is carrying it too far. A glutton is using something that God intended for a good purpose but for a selfish reason, ending up being a wrong reason. So there's some things that uh, we need to better understand. And this is an area where <clears throat> a lot of people need further instruction. And all of us need to be reminded of this. Question number two. How does Paul further explain Christian freedom expressed in the statement, all things are lawful for me? Well, he explains this by saying, but not all things are profitable. They're not all beneficial. Uh, yes, there's a. you can go beyond the limits. You can go beyond the purpose for which something is brought into existence. But when you do, you're asking for trouble. Because God knows what he's doing and why he's doing it. And we need to recognize what God has in mind. Does God forbid certain things? Yes, he does. Uh, well, let me just give you one example. When the day came that uh, the people ceased being vegetarians and began to add meat to their diet, what restriction did God give with regard to the eating of that meat? Couldn't boil it in its mother's milk. All right. You can only eat certain meats, not all of them. Yes. Couldn't eat the blood. That's what I was thinking of. Oh, okay. uh, he made very certain uh, that's a prohibition. And so uh, meat 
ha has to be properly bled in order for it to be used the way that God intends for it to be used. So God made that one of the instructions he gave back in the Old Testament times. And of course there were some things that were forbidden in that day that are not forbidden today. And we need to appreciate that. And a part of it, I think, is explained by the fact that they did not have refrigeration and means of preservation that we do today. And so he's dealing with people in that day with their limited access to a lot of things we just simply take for granted today. One thing is true. If God has forbidden something, that's off limits. We should have nothing to do with anything that God has commanded to be uh, off limits. That we should not have anything to do with it. So when he, he says, but not all things are profitable. Uh, let's be very open here. What are some of the things that we do that... Uh, really are not very profitable for us. You mean in the money-making way or in the... Any um, way, oh, any okay. way. Overeating. Over smoke. Overeating? Yeah, I, I think gluttony is obviously outside the limits of what God intended. Nothing wrong with eating. People who smoke. Well, I think you're exactly right. I think that uh, <clears throat> anything we do that's going to rob the body of the proper nutrition and health that God intended it should have, I think we need to be careful of that. I put junk food in that category. I think some people are not really that careful about what they eat or what they do not eat. <coughs> and not only the amount of what they eat or don't eat, but what the very things that they do eat. Um, I think that one of the things that's off limits is when we uh, waste our money. I think another thing that's off limits is when we waste our time. I don't think God put us here on the earth just to sit around and twiddle our thumbs. That doesn't mean that you have to be working at a job where you're receiving pay. It doesn't mean that you have to be up on your feet all the time. But it does mean that uh, 24 hours day and night, week after week, we ought to be aware of the fact that we are here as God's representatives. And there is never a time that a Christian is off duty. In other words, our lives are going to influence other people. And uh, how many people would be embarrassed to be caught doing some of the things they're doing? That might be an indication that maybe this is something that ought not to be done to begin with. If it's going to embarrass you, perhaps you should not have done it beforehand. How many people say things and after they've said it, uh, they didn't realize somebody's listening to it, that they wish it never heard it, and it wouldn't have if they never said it to begin with. It's a piece of gossip, and you shouldn't start that to begin with. Uh, I think this is a very practical thing. And I think it affects every one of us. And I don't want to be misunderstood here. Uh, I don't think God intended for any of us to be lazy. But I also don't believe that God intended for everyone is to be equally active, especially when you get older. I'm speaking out of experience now. There are some things you just are not able to do that you once did, and I don't think God expects us to do that. But I don't believe that old age is an excuse to sit around and do nothing. I think as long as we live and breathe, we need to recognize God has a purpose for me upon this life, upon this earth, in this life. And it may be... Uh, our continued devotion to reading his word. I observe that uh, a lot of older people spend more time reading the Bible than younger people. And maybe part of us do the fact that they have more time. Uh, they're not in a rush, rush mode all the time. I don't think there's ever an excuse for any of us to neglect Bible reading. But I think it's very obvious that uh, we can spend a lot of more time meditating on uh, pers certain passages of scripture. Uh, we can spend time in prayer. Uh, we can spend time writing letters. And somebody may say to you, what do you do today? Well, nothing much. You may have done a whole lot and not even realize it because you made a phone call that cheered somebody up, that just waiting for somebody to realize that somebody notices them and remembers them. You may have sent a letter, a card, to try to cheer somebody up. There's just so many things that we can do, little things, that are going to affect us. What I'm saying is, 
The bottom line, anything that we do, whatever we do, whenever we do it, if God is not honored, if he's not praised, we don't have any reason for doing it. We ought not to be doing it. And I think this would change a lot of our schedules if we just simply realized that, uh, you know, there's some things that we, have, we can do, but uh, they're, they're not things that we ought to do. God has given us minds to think with. But what do a lot of people do with their thinking? They let themselves be worried stiff. And God doesn't want us to sit around and worry. Doesn't want us to sit around and feel sorry for ourselves. He wants us to pray. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. So this is something that's very serious. Uh, I think it may, uh, makes a difference uh, where I do business. Uh, there are some places I choose not to go. Uh, why do I not go there? Uh, is the food they're serving not good food? Probably is. But uh, I just think, can I get a good dinner to eat without going to a bar to get that dinner to eat? Supposing that the people saw me, I don't even know where the bars are in this town, but if there's a bar in this town, <laughs> Supposing they saw me entering that bar and they knew who I was, they say, oh, man, I can't believe that. Look where he went. Well, don't I have just as much right going there as anybody else? Sure. Yeah. Don't they serve good food? I, I presume they do. I've never been there. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I, I just think of a place as known as a tavern. Uh, you know, I, I find that uh, some people are more lax at where they go and what they do than it used to be. And I think that perhaps there was a time maybe we were too strict and we got our priorities all mixed up. Uh, I recognize there are some things that in themselves are not wrong, but the association they have almost makes it wrong. Uh, am I making any sense to you? Mm -hmm. I caused somebody to stumble. Yeah. If they saw you going in a bar, I mean, a, a Christian. Yeah. It ruins your witness, I think. You know, I think billiards probably is a, a fun game to play. But uh, some of the places where they have pool tables, mm -hmm. I would feel uncomfortable in. Mm -hmm. And I would feel embarrassed if certain people saw me there. Because what are they going to do? They're going to jump to a conclusion. They may be right, they may be wrong. But why should I run that risk? when we can avoid taking that risk. I think that, uh, this is gonna sound like I'm being judgmental, I don't mean to be, I'm preaching to myself, I want you to know that. But I really believe that we have to be very careful that uh, we don't honestly regard, can I really take the Lord with me where I'm going today? Is he going to want to participate with me in what I'm about to participate in? Is this going to be something that's honorable? Good report, worthy, pure. Is this my, is this something that might lead some people astray? Uh, I can't tell you how many different students, through my years of working in the Bible College, have come to me in kind of a statement of shock. Said uh, we were in this person's home, and we thought they were good Christians until they opened the refrigerator. And what they saw in the refrigerator shocked them. And I'm not sure that the people who had it in the refrigerator were even concerned about the fact that anybody else was being shocked. Do I think that we need to be concerned about what others think of us? Yes, I do. Do I think that I need to let other people determine what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do? No, I do not. I think it's a matter between me and God. But can I honestly honor God and please God if I'm someplace where I would be embarrassed to be found by certain people? Am I doing something that I have to hide to run in the corner to do? And if so, why? Now, there may be a justifiable reason for hiding yourself in some instances. But when he says not all things are profitable, I think the guiding line is if I can't do it to God's glory, then I ought not to do it. Number four, um, 
explain, I will not be mastered by anything. Uh, I think what he's talking about here is when you begin to do something, if you're not careful, it's going to become a habit. You remember that little ditty? You sow an act. You sow a thought, rather, and you reap an act. You sow an act, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a character. You sow a character, and you reap a destiny. Where did it all begin? Back in the thought. What do you really think about this? Is this a wholesome thought? Is this something that... You know, the Bible says, set your affection on things which are above and not upon the things of this world. Does my mind constantly feed upon the things of this world? Am I living for self or am I living for God? Am I doing it because I want to do it? Am I doing it because I think it's okay, but I'm not sure that God would okay it? We have to be very careful that in everything we do, who is our master? Christ is. We walk in His steps. Verse 13. Uh, food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both, the, both of them, Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now, beginning with this verse, and you may want to write this down, Paul is going to give six arguments against indulgence. Six arguments are things that we ought not to be participating in, in a way that is beyond what the Lord permits. In other words, he's going to give a variety of illustrations of what was made for a good purpose that has been used for a bad purpose. So that we cannot say, well, how was I to know this? So the first one, the first argument is, the body is not for immorality. The body is for the Lord. I like the thing that was pointed out in our men's Bible study uh, last night. I just wish everyone could be involved in it, but... Uh, Emphasis was really made as we looked at the very first part of 1 John chapter 1 about the disciples saying, that which we have seen and touched and handled and heard, these are things relating to the body. I touched him. I heard him. I saw him. He's not a phantom. It's not something that's a figment of the imagination. It's for real. And the point was made that there is a real reason why Christ died bodily. And what he's dealing with in this chapter really follows along with what we studied last night in our Bible study, and that is God is concerned about our bodies. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. We're going to get to that in a few moments. But he said, the body is not for immorality. It is for God. Now, what does Paul mean when he writes, God will do away with both of them? He talks about food is for the stomach and stomach is for the food. Is he going to do away with both of them? Yes, yes ultimately he is. Will our bodies one day return to the element from whence they came? Mm -hmm. Yes, they will. Will our stomach reach a day when it no longer is needed? Mm -hmm. Yes, it will. Is the body important? Yes, it is. Will we have a body in eternity? Yes, we will. Will we hunger and thirst in eternity? No. That's for this body. So he says there's a, person, there's a purpose for this body. Uh, our bodies are the only way that I know of that we can actually be a living sacrifice. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you pre present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Christ has no hands to do his work but my hands, your hands. He has no feet to run his errands except your feet and my feet. He has no heart to be sympathetic to others who need comforting except your heart, my heart. We have bodies. These bodies are for the Lord. Now, what makes immorality wrong? Immor immorality wrong, yes. The thing that makes it wrong is not that uh, sex is not something that God intended for us to experience, 
but he's saying there's a right and a wrong purpose for it. And people have taken something that God has indicated should be very, very personal and intimate between husband and wife for that purpose and for that purpose only. And when people allow that which God has intended should uh, bring in unity man and woman in the marriage relationship is totally out of place and is completely wrong when it becomes something that's done for any other reason, particularly for self-gratification. That's the point that he wants to make known. And a lot of people simply uh, laugh at that sort of thing. And I tell you folks, they're going to give an account for this someday, and they're going to suffer eternal consequences as well as certain consequences even here and now. Now, explain the fact that the Lord is for the body. The Lord gave us a body for a reason. And my purpose is, what does he intend for me to do with my eyes? What does he really want me to see out there? What does he intend for me to hear? What does he intend for me to touch and handle? Where does he intend for me to go? What does he intend for me to say? These are all things, and we do it every day. Even if you live just with one other person, or if you live even by yourself, does God intend that you should use some of your thought processes to talk to God and to let God talk with you? And if we have a telephone, is God going to use that telephone? Uh, God going to expect us to use that telephone to uh, speak a word of cheer to somebody else or to express a desire to be helpful, if in any way we can be helpful? Uh, any number of ways, but God made us bodily for a reason. And I have to say, okay, why has God given me these hands? What does he intend for me to accomplish with them? What does he intend for me to accomplish with my mind? Where does he intend my feet should take me? And I'm afraid that too many times we don't view life that way. But I think that's what he's saying here. There's a purpose for every function of the body. And he's going to zero in particularly upon immorality, which has been a problem throughout history unfortunately. It just is something that's flaunted by the world all around us and people just assume, hey, it's fun, let's do it, and they forget the real purpose of it and no wonder the homes are crumbling day by day all around us because we're not paying attention to God's purpose for our lives. Verse 14, now God has not only raised the Lord but will also raise up us through his power. So the second argument he's giving here is that God will make the body glorious. God will make the body glorious. Notice, our bodies have a future. Though they will go through and experience a change, yet the same person that occupies this body is going to occupy a heavenly body to spend eternity with God. So, how does this verse fit in with the previous verse? Well, if the body is to be raised, the body must be important. Did Jesus demonstrate that a body can be effectively used to his glory after that body has experienced death? Yep. Yes. yes, by his own resurrection. Now, are we going to be resurrected as Christ is resurrected? Yes, we are. You have any problem about that? Where is it? Matthew chapter. No, not Matthew. John chapter 5. Down around verses 27, 28, somewhere along in there. In, uh, you know, we're going to be judged on the day of judgment by what we have done in our bodies. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, which we're going to get there someday, maybe, uh, <laughs> we're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And what's going to happen on that judgment day? Folks, listen. <clears throat> the thing that's going to happen for every one of us here tonight, or this afternoon, God is going to take note that we were here. God is going to take note of what we are doing. God knows what it is that brought us here. Our bodies are here for a special purpose. To hear to read, to study, to learn about God, 
to encourage one another in being right with God, will that come up in the day of judgment? Yes, it will. Everything that is done in this body does not go unnoticed. Our judgment is based upon our bodies. Now, we're not saved by good works. We're rewarded by good works. We're saved by grace through faith. That's in Ephesians 2.8. But down in verse 12 he said, Not of works, lest any man should boast. In verse 10, rather, he says, Our bodies are to put, be put forth to accomplish good works and are going to be rewarded for that. What assurance do we have of our bodily resurrection? The whole 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is given over to the subject of the resurrection. This body determines where our new body is going to spend eternity. Hmm. It's kind of like getting in a car to go on a trip. You know where you're wanting to go. When you get in the car, you just say, okay, I'm just going to drive it anywhere the road looks nice. You going to reach your destination? Maybe not. Maybe getting to your destination is going to take you over some rugged terrain. Maybe it's going to take you through a lot of heavy traffic. Is that true in life? Yeah, it is. Can we predict whether each day is going to be a, a good day or a bad day, physically, materially speaking? No, we can't. But can we be sure that every day, regardless of what faces us along the way, is taking us closer to our desired destination? Yes, we can. That's why we have a road map. The Bible's our road map. It tells us how to live every day so that every mile we take, we are getting one step closer to God and eternity with Him. Verse 16, 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ? and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. So the third argument is, our bodies belong to Christ. Now when we get over to the 12th and 13th uh, chapters and 14th chapters of uh, 1 Corinthians, and particularly chapter 12, he's going to liken each one of us as a member of the body of Christ. And he's going to use our physical bodies to illustrate this. Some of us are hands, some of us are feet, some of us are eyes, some of us are ears, some of us are voices. What does he mean by that? We're variously talented. Do I need you? Do you need me? Do we all need each other? Yes, we do. Far more than most of us realize. Let me tell you something. Do you know what would make the churches of Merritt Island more effective next Sunday morning? than they usually are, if everyone who called themselves a Christian were present, that'd make the news. That just doesn't happen. Why? And I woke up and I was tired. I just didn't feel like getting ready to go to church. Okay. Was that person missed? Yeah. Does it sometimes become a vigil? Yeah. What part of my body am I willing to give up? None of it, really. I mean, you know, good health is having every part of the body functioning as it's supposed to function. That same thing is true in the body of Christ. And folks, it's not a chore. This, these people look at Christians and say, man, it's just a lot of negative things you can't do. I think, no, no, it's a lot of positive things we're privileged to do. Isn't it great to know that what you're doing is going to have eternal benefits? Isn't it great to know that if you're living for the Lord, you don't have to look behind you and wonder, have I led anybody astray today? I don't think so. Well, we can honestly say, no, I've not led anybody astray, when we know that we've been following the guidance of the Lord, doing His will. So, we are members of the body of Christ. What is suggested with the question, do you not know? Now he's going to ask this question three times. Here in verse 15, again in verse 16, 
And again in verse 19, what's he doing? He's saying, don't you realize this? I mean, any Christian should know this. Any person in their right mind should understand this. Don't you know that you belong to Christ? Did you become a Christian and think, well, I don't have any relationship with Lord Jesus Christ? Something's wrong there. I remember the time that I was filling the pulpit for a preacher when he's away, and the elders called me in advance of the service before I left home and said, uh, we've got three young people that want to be baptized. Would you baptize them when you come? And of course, my initial thought was, why don't you baptize them? You don't have to be a preacher to baptize people. Anybody can baptize. But nevertheless, I didn't say that. I just said, yes, I'll be glad to. But I said, I hope you've talked with them and they know what they're doing. And he said, yes, we have. They know what they're doing. But I just felt a little bit uneasy about that. So here are three teenagers that uh, came forward at the close of the service and they wanted to be baptized. And there the whole congregation was. They stayed there to witness their baptism. And uh, I said to the three teenagers, I just stood there, looked them in their faces, and I said, uh, I want to make sure that you understand the question I'm going to ask you. I said, here's my question. I'm going to ask you if you believe that Jesus is the Christ and Son of the living God. And you're going to answer me that. But before you answer that, I hope you understand what my question is. Do you believe that Jesus is Christ? That word Christ means anointed one. Who's anointed? Well, in the Bible, there were three different groups of people that were anointed. Prophets, priests, and kings. Jesus is all three. He's the greatest of all prophets. Well, what's a prophet? A prophet is somebody who speaks on behalf of God. And Jesus came to the earth to speak on behalf of God. He represented God. So much so he could say, he that has seen me has seen God. The Father and I are one. So he is the one that we need to listen to. Because he expresses the mind of God. I said the priest, he's also the priest. He's our great high priest. What's the purpose of the priest? Well, the priest represents man to God. Did Jesus represent us to God? Yes, he does. In fact, that's what he's doing right now. He is at the right hand of God. He's interceding on our behalf. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, he points out that if you confess me before men, what's he gonna do? Confess us before the Father. Also, he said, if you deny me before me, I'll deny you before the Father. So it makes a difference. Do we stand up for him? As our priest, he stands up for us when we are on his side and are loyal to him. I said, he's also the king. You know who the king is? He's the one in charge. He's the one that gives the orders. He's the one that we have to submit to in obedience. I said, now I'm going to ask you if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, it's the living God. That means, are you going to let him tell you what to do and what not to do? Are you going to be obedient? Don't tell me you are if you're not. Are you going to accept the sacrifice he made as your high priest when he offered his own body in place of you to take away your sins? <clears throat> are you going to listen to him when he speaks because he speaks for God? Do you really want him to be your spokesman? Are you really going to submit your life to him? Now, all the time I'm talking to these three teenagers, I'm very much aware there's a congregation out there. I have a sneaking feeling that some of them were hearing this for the first time. But I wanted them to hear it. And it's something that all of us need to be reminded of. It's so easy just to, yeah, I believe that. How many times have we followed up saying, would you explain to me what you just meant when you said I believe that? I think a lot of them. Uh, uh, uh. That's kind of sad. That's why I think it's very important that people learn the basics and understand that words have meaning. How did Jesus say it? 
Why do you call me Lord, Lord, if you're not going to do what I tell you to do? I mean, I'm not your Lord unless you do what I tell you to do. And there are a lot of people who say, Lord, Lord. And he said, I don't know you. Yes, you do. Well, I prophesied your name. I never told you to do that. But I performed miracles in your name. I never told you to do that. I cast out demons in your name. I never told you to do that. Huh? Who makes up the rules? Too many times we do, don't we? Well, this seems like the religious thing to do. Well, la di da maybe it does. But is that what the Lord said? Where is it in his word? We need to really appreciate how important it is that we are members of the body of Christ. He's the head, and we are the body. What is my head for? I'm supposed to give my directions to my hands and my feet, my tongue. In what sense are our bodies members of Christ? Obviously, in a spiritual sense. We are His in the sense that when His Spirit dwells within us, He tells us what He wants us to say. Do we say it? That's why when we say something, we need to be able to back it up with God's Word. Otherwise, perhaps it should not be said. When we, rent, when we render opinions, we need to make sure that it is recognized as an opinion, as a person who really is trying to do right, hoping that we've reached the right opinion, but we're always going to be corrected and guided by the clear teachings of God's Word. Now, there are some things in God's Word, he says, this is wrong. Just no place for it at all. We need to recognize it. Question number three. What does Paul illustrate with a marriage relationship? He is pointing out here in this area of morality that God created man and woman to be one and that most intimate of all relationships is unique to marriage to make them one in Christ. And when this is violated by using it for a purpose that God never intended it should be used, you demean that and you have separated yourself from God by forming an unholy alliance with somebody else. So if in our marriage relationship the two become one flesh. This is beautiful. This is God's ordained will for man and woman in the marriage relationship. But when it's used in any other way, totally off limits. And that's the thing that really plagues a sinful, corrupt world. Now folks, uh, let me just remind you that there was a special need for this kind of instruction in the city of Corinth. Corinth in its past was referred to as Sin City. It was known for the prostitutes. Prostitution was the main thing that happened in Corinth. Well known all the way over. Uh, in fact, the phrase, a Corinthian girl, that became the well-known phrase to describe the prostitute. That was the reputation they had. Now, how does God express his horror of the sin of immorality? What does he say in this verse that shows that God really is displeased by this? May it never be. That's right. May it never be. God forbid. And down in verse 18, he's going to say, flee immorality. Run away from it. Does Paul regard the Christian relationship with Christ as intimate and personal? Yes, he does. Did you get that? Your relationship with the Lord is very, very personal with you. My relationship with the Lord is very personal relationship with, you, with me that I have with God. And sometimes we want to make it kind of a group relationship. No, it's not that. It's a very intimate relationship that each one of us personally has with God. So he then explains this. It, you know, it's like, I, I can't leave this alone until I make sure you understand exactly what I'm talking about. Listen to verse 16. Do you not know? There's that question again. This is a common sense. What are you thinking? Are you not thinking wisely? Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. So what's he saying? If you only understood from the very beginning 
why I said it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make a help me for him. And that the two shall become one in flesh. Have you not realized that? Do you not know that? Surely they know that. What is the basis of the common knowledge that one who joins himself to a harlot is one body with her? Well, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 5, the Lord says the two will become one flesh, as is also pointed out in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. So God has made his, his will known very clearly in this regard. So if you've been reading the Bible, if you've been studying the Bible, if you've been listening to what Paul has been preaching, anybody knows that this is something that is supposed to be unique to the marriage relationship. Verse 3, in what God is what God said concerning the two becoming one flesh, true in fornication as it is in marriage. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Fornication is the gratification of lust, total dist distortion of what God intended. Fornication is not natural. Don't you forget, God is a jealous God. What is God saying? You belong to me. Do you remember the Ten Commandments? One of the commandments says, don't make any graven images. No idols. There's no substitute for me. You're my people. And the Bible says, in that same passage, our God is a jealous God. Now let me make sure we understand what that means. When you talk about jealousy, do you not ordinarily think about sin? Mm -hmm. Envy, jealousy, one of, the, one of the sins. There's another use for the word jealous. God is a jealous God. What does jealousy mean? Jealousy means resenting a rival. Think about that. Resenting a rival. So uh, here's a person that comes to me and says, uh, I've heard that you are really good at uh, horseshoes. And I looked at him and said, yeah, nobody by any better than I am. He said, I want to challenge that. I said, that's great. That'll just make me feel that much better because I'm going to whoop you. <laughs> so let's get out here and pitch the horseshoes. And lo and behold, he beats me. So what do I do? I get mad. And there's not enough bad things I can say about him. I'm mad. He destroyed my good reputation. I was a champion of all horseshoe players. And he took that away from me. I'll get him if it's the last thing that I do. Am I jealous? Yeah. yeah. Am I resenting a rival? Yeah. He showed me up. Is that right? That is terribly wrong. Another person come along and said, they look at my wife and say, mm, boy, ah, I think I want her. I say, over my dead body, you can't have her. Am I jealous? Yes. Do I have a right to be jealous? Yes. In fact, there's something wrong with me if I'm not. That makes sense to you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, folks, that's exactly the way God feels about every one of us in this room right now. We belong to Him. We're not living for self. That's selfishness. We're living for God. He's our master. He's the head. He's the mind that is to direct everything in this body. My lifestyle my aspirations, my daily activities, everything should be to His glory, to His honor. We are His representatives here on earth. Our God is a jealous God. Does this make any sense? No wonder God is so concerned about the fact that people are abusing something that He intended to be very, very beautiful. A relationship of a Christian with the Lord ought to be one of the most wonderful things that ever happened. And shame on us when we look at that and say, 
Well, I guess to please God, I guess I have to do it. Oh, my. Does that make for good relationships? Because I feel like God to do it? I don't think so. God is a jealous God. That's in Deuteronomy 5, 9. Verse 17. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now, why is it important to know and understand the truth of this verse? Because it's only when the Holy Spirit dwells within us that we can be at one with God. The Holy Spirit is the one whom we receive as moving into our bodies and occupying this body with us. So now as Christians, we're never alone. By the way, isn't that what Jesus promised? Lo, I'm with you always, to the very end. So those who follow Christ receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit speaks to us through His Word. That's why we're here today, listening to His Word, responding to what He has to say to us. So our responsibility is to make sure that my thought process is pure, that my actions are right, that my whole lifestyle is in harmony with God's will. What does it mean to be joined to the Lord? I think he's talking here about a very close relationship with the Lord. Joined in the sense that we're not going to be separated. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. Paul writes, we are more than conquerors through Christ. In Christ, we have the strength to do all that God wants us to do. There are some things we just are not to do. It's outside God's will. Verse 18, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. So here's the fourth argument. Fornication is against the body. All these arguments are the arguments that Paul is giving to show why these things are so important. Fornication is against the body. And our bodies belong to the Lord. Now why does Paul state in the best way, what, what does Paul state is the best way to deal with the temptation to be immoral? Wait. Run as fast as you can. Get as far away from it as you possibly can. And by the way, this is one of those passages where you just have to say, folks, you need to know the Greek says, keep on running. You just never quit running. In other words, it's something that is an ongoing thing. It's a habitual action. We are constantly making a habit to run away from anything that is tearing us apart from a right relationship with God. And there are too many people that are not running away. They're not fleeing. They're playing with it. When you play with fire, what happens? Mommy says, you'll get burned. Yep. And mommy's right. Yep. What places immorality in a unique category? The thing that makes immoral activity so wrong is the fact that it robs God of a body that belongs to Him and to Him alone. Therefore, we ought to have nothing to do with anything that's going to separate us from God in the way in which we live our bodies. I was going to drive this point home in verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? That means we're possessed. Now the fifth argument here is the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So he's using a lot of arguments here. This is the fifth one. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now back in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, verses 16 and 17, the word temple was used to describe the body of Christ as a whole, the church, everybody, all Christians. But here, he's applying it to each one of us individually. Your body, my body, belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. What makes our body important? Because we're the temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells. When did the temple take up residence in our lives? When we were baptized. When we were baptized. Exactly right. Chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians and verse 13. By one spirit we were all baptized into one body. 
Now, who abides in the body of the Christian? God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Every one of us. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. All in three. Now, let me read these verses I have listed there for you. In John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said to them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him. And we, Jesus talked about himself and the Father, we will come to him and make our abode with him. So they're in us. They're with us. They're a part of us. We are a part of him. Look at Galatians 2.20. Paul testified, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Wow. It's no longer I that live. Christ that lives in me. Some of you have seen this before. But this verse brings to my mind our relationships with the Lord, according to Galatians Where do you see yourself? Not Christ, but I. That's where much of the world is right now. Christ is not the one that calls the shots. Every man makes the decisions he wants to make. And one day we meet the Lord. And we become acquainted with who Jesus is. We start going to church, we start reading the Bible. And we like what we hear. But we're still a part of the picture. Until the day we became a Christian. The day we became a Christian, we realized it's no longer I the boss. Christ is the boss. I belong to him. But have we matured to the point of the Apostle Paul when he said, not I. Selfishness is gone. I'm no longer ruling along with Christ. He's in charge completely. Not I, but Christ. And how's that happen? When we are crucified with Christ. So we can say it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. How did he say it to the Philippians? Not I, but Christ. For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. I belong to him. He's my Lord. He's everything. I, I wish I knew how to say this in a way that would really penetrate. Too often we forget this. What does it mean to have the Holy Spirit living within us? Folks, the Holy Spirit doesn't cause us to get angry. The Holy Spirit doesn't cause us to get jealous. The Holy Spirit does not cause us to be lackadaisical in a relationship with God. No, the Holy Spirit wants us to be the very best we can, totally surrendered to the will of God. Romans 8, verse 11 says, But if the Spirit of Him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who indwells you. you ever take for granted that people will live with you? Yeah. Let me get real personal. Does the Holy Spirit live in your life? How many times each day do you talk to him? 
better than yet, how many times every day do you listen to him? How many times do you consult him on the decisions you make? On what you do and where you go? And the kind of person you really are? I get the feeling that you are looking at me like, hey, quit preaching so hard to me. <laughs> I just want us to understand this. I just want us to understand this. Number three, what does it mean to have God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit live within us? Okay. Let me tell you something. It doesn't mean you're going to perform miracles. That's an easy way out. That's a way, really, that appeals to self. Look what I did. I'm so close to God, I can perform miracles. Folks, that's a miss the whole point. It's not because we have an extraordinary knowledge of anybody else. No, no, no. I'll tell you what it means. It means simply being pure, being wholesome, being honest, being right, putting Christ first in our lives, living to his glory. What do we learn about our bodies with the temple metaphor? The temple marked what in the minds of the Jewish people? Who was there? God. God. That's what made it so important. If our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, then where is God in our world today? In our body. Wherever we are. How many people do you think recognize that? How often do we recognize that? We are the dwelling place of God. He lives within us. We are His people. We are members of His body. What evidence may we expect when the Holy Spirit dwells in our lives? I think that we ought to go to bed at night knowing I've lived today for the Lord. How that chorus we used to sing at camp go? All day long I've been with Jesus and it's been a wonderful day. He has led me one step higher in the good old gospel way. I wish I could remember the rest of it. But it ends up saying, something to the effect, I'm so happy because all day long I've been with Jesus. Well, what's the significance of you're not your own? This is a significant, this is the sixth argument when he says we are under new ownership. We belong to him. We're not our own. So can I make these decisions? No, not if you're a Christian. Not if Christ is your Lord. You can't say he's your Lord if you're not going to do what he tells you to do. Now, is that hard? No. It's rewarding. It's wonderful. It gives you a good night of rest. Really. You don't have to wonder, did I go someplace I shouldn't have gone? Did I say something I shouldn't have said? Not if all day long the Lord has been with you and you've been with him. So he sums it up in this chapter in verse 20 when he says, For you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. By the way, the price that was paid, as emphasized both in 1 Peter chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 1, what was that price? Blood. What's in the blood? Life. It cost Christ his life. When he paid the price that we might be bought back from sin who gained control of us. So, how do we glorify God in our body? To live for Him. To live for Him. So, can I do this job and the Lord be happy that I'm doing it? Can I say these words and the Lord be pleased with my saying it? Can I be with these people and the Lord be pleased because I'm with them? Hmm. Let's pray. Father in heaven, an awesome thought, but a present reality that you have honored us with being the temple in which you dwell. May the world see you clearly. 
when they come to this temple. In this temple, may they find purity, love, mercy, kindness, goodness, gentleness. May others see Christ in each one of us. Encourage us to make this the goal of our life every day of every week as long as blood flows through these veins i pray in jesus name amen, amen. thank you thank you professor Bourne.